Hello. Well, okay, so elephant in the room policy is a dull thing. It's kind of hard to make it sexy, but I'm going to try and get your attention. So bear with me. So to set the scene, I'm in a lift. Yes, American friends, we really do call them lifts. Four people walk in. I think to myself, Chris, this is your moment now or never. As the doors close, I position myself in front of them. A captive audience. They're mine. I've got them. I hear the door seal shut behind me and I take a breath. I look to the first person on my left. She's in a suit. She looks really important to me. I gesture to her. See? She looks back at me as if to say, yes, go on. I? She nods. Oh, ah, perfect. The CIO, the policymaker, the one whose neck is on the block. What are the chances of finding you in my imaginary lift today? I ask her, well, what keeps you up at night? And she tells me, I don't know what teams are really doing, the volume of risk and what I should then show more interest in. Setting and changing policy is hard and, uh, and to communicate and people just go off and do their own thing. They think they know better and to be honest, often they do, but I'm ultimately left playing catch up with the risk that they've signed me up to. Okay, I say, try not to sound like a snake, a patronising snake oil salesman. I can help. I turn my attention to the second person, also in a suit, but they look slightly less important. I make a guess. Let's face it, this is my imagination. It'd be weird if I was wrong. Product manager, I say. Uh, they nod. Ah, the whip cracker, I say. Well, what's important to you? So managing risk, mostly opportunity risk, the fear of missing out. So getting features out the door, avoiding getting bogged down with... They glance to the CIO bureaucracy that feels almost like it's designed to slow me down. Awesome, I say. This is your lucky day. I turn to the next person, dressed in overalls. I'm in a trendy part of town. They could be the CTO. Before I ask, they sense me staring at them. Cleaner, they say. Huh. Well, how did you get in my mansion? Okay, let me come back to you. My attention goes to the last person. Hoodie, headphones around the neck. Ah, my stereotypical developer. Yes, I know you well. What code do you write? I ask. It doesn't actually matter. Python. Cool. I have. Uh, uh, have you got everything updated to work with? I pause. Python 3? They volunteer. Ah, yes. Python 3. That must be hard, I add. They don't know it, but I've actually just won a bit of their trust, which is, as we know, important. Nearly, they say. Cool. OK, well, what's important to you? Staying on top of patching dependencies so that we can react to the next fire. Knowing what rules exist, what ones I can bend, break, and what might cause me to lose my job. Writing consistent, good quality code and avoiding technical debt. So the rest of my team being able to work co cohesively as one. Do you use any tools to help you with that, I ask? Yeah, linters, code quality, test coverage tools, the, the usual. Great, I say, I write code too. Let's be friends, and I hand them a printed QR code and say, here's my public GPG key, so you know that you can trust what I say. I return my focus to the cleaner. I've got it. How do you get told what to do and when it changes? Well, we get a memo, or something gets stuck to the notice board. So last week we got a memo saying that all the meeting room white balls needed to be cleaned every night. Interesting, I say. Well, how does that work out? Well... It's up to us to then maintain the to-do list so that we can onboard new people. Does it go wrong at all? Yeah, sometimes when we compile our operational manual, we miss a memo or don't apply them maybe in sequence and we do get things wrong. They glance apologetically to the project manager. Like when we hadn't updated the guide that the meeting room on the third floor was being used as a dedicated wall room and we wiped all their boards down. I looked to the dev. Does that sound familiar? I ask. They nod. Turns out we're not all special snowflakes, hey? Ah, all is not lost. I knew there was a reason that I imagined you here today. The lift is slowing. I feel it coming to its destination. Great. I've got the silver bullet. The CIO looks to me, ready to buy whatever it is I'm selling. They ask me as the doors open, who are you and what team are you in? As I move out of the way, so to stop obstructing them, I answer, oh, I didn't work here. I, I just here to fix the lift. People have been complaining that it goes only goes to the top floor no matter what button they push and it's actually pretty slow. My audience storms out, furious, heading towards the stairs. The doors shut and I get back to my job. 
Okay, so if any of this sounds familiar and you can relate to my imaginary friends, then I've got the answers for you. What if I said you could update policy easily, even releasing, say, several version updates, not just in a year, a month? What about 10 updates in a single day and seamlessly communicating that to the people that need to consume it, all without derailing them? You could have visibility on compliance tools, maybe that you already use, and that policy that could be readily consumable, easy to pass, demonstrate compliance and make sense and not be bureaucratic to change when it needs to be, and ultimately not get in the way. That same policy could be treated as a dependency and operate like a linter, so you can run compliance checks locally in CI and guard production ultimately. That multiple versions of the policy can act like a dependency and are supported, so emergencies like you must update now because there's now known vulnerability type updates are in effect a business as usual activity to communicate. Interesting? Okay, hang around. Let's crack on. Now, I've hopefully got your attention. It's time to introduce myself and start explaining things. My name is Chris Nesbitt-Smith. I'm currently an instructor for LearnKit and also Control Plane, a consultant to the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK uh, government and a tinkerer of open source things. I've spent a fair amount of my professional career now working in UK Gov and large organisations where problems like these are rife. I've been, we'll have time at the end uh, for questions and heckles. Um, so please uh, uh, kind of leave questions in the, in the comments. So, while this is not live or in person where I might be able to ask you to, say, raise your hands, we can still try some audience participation. So, if you could leave a comment of Policymaker, if you're with my CIO and have set, written or applied policy before. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Just If you've written policy, just leave a comment of Policymaker. Okay, next round. If you have ever sought exemption or maybe consciously bent, broken, circumvented, ignored, bypassed, whatever, a policy with at least good intentions, could you leave a comment of policy breaker? So if you've bent, broken, circumvented, ignored, bypassed the policy, hopefully with some good intentions or not, leave a comment of policy breaker. Well, hopefully some of you at least fell for it. So we've got all of your names and employers details. So can I lend me your ears? The stakes just got raised. So where do I see policy as code going wrong? Well, before we dig into that, what do I mean by policy? So it usually comes in one of two forms. So security enforcing like data at rest being encrypted, for example or maybe perhaps consistency enforcing, such as code style tabs being two or four space indentation, maybe. Or maybe you can think of some others, but in any case, it's hopefully intended to mitigate a risk of some sort. However, with the best of intentions, there are often emotionally led rather than being grounded in proportionate control, which is ultimately the open door to a case by case exemptions then being required when you come against a situation that you weren't anticipating. So this is not fundamentally unlike how the laws of the land are created with case law making for a complex to navigate rule book and harder still to measure for compliance. It often looks like the thin end of a wedge where the precedent, which may have been an uncomfortable pill to swallow the first time round, becomes dangerous with others ultimately looking to expand upon its scope. Which can lead us to wonder sometimes if the cure was actually worse than the disease. But that's not how we at least typically develop software. So why does this have to be so hard? There surely must be a better answer. Well, we've codified everything else, so isn't that the answer? Well, yes in part, but my point of this talk is that we do it wrong. Maybe some of you are screaming your favorite product name at me in your heads as the solution, and you're not wholly wrong. But the devil's in the detail. Just throwing some curly braces at something doesn't inherently fix things though. So if it's a security control, it's often tempting to keep the policy a secret. 
exposing it could maybe be used against you by an adversary. However, that does not support a shifting left at all. It results in devs effectively reverse engineering what the policy is by finding out when we smash our heads up against it. It doesn't therefore take much imagination to see that in the scenario of an application deploy midway through, finding one resource is non-compliant and rejected would have the overall deploy in an inconsistent halfway state, likely resulting in downtime. Which begs the question, what's the policy better than the downtime and the, and the impact? Especially if it leads your engineers, who are all hopefully at all plenty smart, at finding inventive, shall we say, ways around the computer says no response that they've got. This is further exasperated when updates to the policy are desired. So maybe you get a pen test or something goes wrong. So you form that case law in effect that you maybe need to apply a new policy. So for example, maybe all S3 buckets now need to be encrypted. A change that could be considered a breaking one. Sure, you might say we provide warnings on at least the less important issues or new emerging policy, which is great so long as someone sees them. But if you've adopted GitOps or at least CICD, is anyone seeing those warnings? Who studies the results of a successful build log every time? Anyone? Every time? Well, if you are, I politely suggest you're probably missing the point of CICD. You should ultimately be able to trust your job status. Okay, well, I'm not just here to throw stones. So remember my implied promises to my four imaginary friends of what that future promised land might look like. Well, there's nothing new under the sun here. We've actually already unwittingly solved these problems elsewhere. We just need to remind ourselves and join the dots together. Well, the first is something you're, if you're doing policy as code, you're probably already doing by putting it in version control. The thing you might not be doing though is making that then visible. So, at least in a source this, by which I mean allow everyone within your walled garden of employees, suppliers, subcontractors, so on, to see the policy. I'm not saying you give all your threat monitoring rules and intel away, you can probably keep that to yourself, but I'd argue visible policy and the gaps therein is often better than the downtime reversed engineers workarounds and opaque legacy exemption spaghetti soup. So. If you're brave, you might even open source it. You'll find it unlocks the ability to work well with prospective suppliers without NDAs and whatnot. And ultimately, widely distributed secrets are expensive to maintain, difficult to handle, and often only stay secret for so long after all. Okay, well, we're off to a good start. Our policy is visible now to those that need to see it. So many of you, no doubt, are used to semantic versioning, but a quick recap. The first segment is used to indicate a breaking, perhaps conflicting change. So in the context of policy, let's say it's requiring resources to have, say, a department label. Maybe that will help with some internal cross-charging. Who knows? I'm not judging. An increment to that might look like requiring that to be, to be a, a predetermined list rather than just free text. The next segment is to indicate minor changes that shouldn't really break anyone. So an increment to that might look like correcting a spelling mistake on one of the department names. The third segment is to indicate patch changes. So these should be a no brainer to keep up to date with. So an increment to that might look like adding a department to the available options. Okay, so our policy is visible in a repository. Now it's versioned so we can easily communicate the policy. We can tack on release notes and expectations are managed by our semantic versioning. In software, we're used to handling dependencies. So what if your policy was just another dependency? So you might unwittingly already be doing this, for example, if you use, say, ESLint as a dependency in your JavaScript package. So. Our policy is visible in a repository, it's version so that we can easily communicate the policy and we can tack on release notes and expectations are all managed by Semver. It's beginning to look a bit more like software. Okay, so I know testing is a dirty word, but in order to make this an asset that everyone can depend on and also provide good examples, tests are essential to give everyone the confidence and the stability and surface potential side effects before they ultimately hurt everyone involved. Consumers of this policy need to be able to test themselves against the policy locally and in CI/CD, thus shortening the feedback and better informing things.
So as a bonus, we should be able to find our consumers able to rely on the artifact that we're sharing with them. Well, we're well and truly on the home stretch. It's a dependency, so updating it should be no different to any other. We can even use some magic like, say, GitHub's Dependable or uh, Men's now White Source's Renovate to do that for us. So think automatic pull requests, tests, even auto merging if you like. OK, so to check you're all still with me, can anyone leave a comment below and tell me a recent event that caused everyone to want to know what version of a potentially uh, logging doohickey we were potentially running everywhere in the estate? Yep, as you know, all presentations this year are contractually required to reference Log4j, even if it's almost entirely out of context. And include some memes. In just a few short months, I'll be able to remove these and hopefully just point broadly at a set of scary looking CVEs in order to continue commanding your behaviour through fear. What I'm getting at here, though, is that situational awareness piece around software supply chain uh, is something the organisation is hopefully already thinking about, if not perhaps addressing. So if our policy is a dependency, this is at least not a new problem. Software bill of materials for the win, right? Which then can allow us to measure the compliance across the, state, uh, the estate. So I've just covered a lot of ground and hopefully sounded convincing, or at least a little bit. And it's not just a fictional utopia that's painted in PowerPoint. It's time to look at how you might be actually able to do this. And I know you really came here wanting to be able to see just a million words on a slide, not just the odd emoji or two that you've seen so far. So we've reached the point of the show where I get to show you some code. Hooray! So to maintain scope, I'm going to limit things to talking about two things to prove that it's not just one tech or one tool. I've arbitrarily picked Terraform and Kubernetes, but I could have probably picked anything. Naturally, I'm going to need some tools to do this. I'm too lazy to really invent anything here myself. So likewise, I'm going to pick two tools. But again, I could choose any or even uh, all of them, probably. So Chekhov is going to be doing my uh, Terraform and Canervo will be doing my Kubernetes. So if you want to kind of browse along with me, I've created an example GitHub organization here. Um, so uh, I'm not expecting you to kind of read or grok the code off the video. Um, so don't worry about it too much. I'm showing it here just to prove that this is a real thing. But github.com slash policy dash as dash version dash code. So let's kick off. So the policy is stored here in the policy repository. So here's where my policy starts at version 1.00. I've got policy that here that requires a department label on all resources. In effect, so long as it's set, it doesn't matter what it is, but it needs to be defined. I've written tests for this, so note how the parsing test case is usable as a great example of what good and bad looks like. We've pushed a tag in Git, we've added release notes, and I can sign it to provide further assurance if my heart so desires. It does, obviously, but moving on. Version 2.00 looks similar, only now that the department field has to be one from a predetermined list. Like before, tests exist, release notes are written, tags are signed. 2.1.0 is where we notice a, and correct a spelling mistake of one of the options in that list of departments. 2.11, and I've now added a new department to the list. Okay, so there's some other repositories that are in that org. App1 and Infra1, well, they depend on version 1.00 of the policy. It's not compliant with version 2 or greater. But how do I know that? Well, I've configured Renovate to automatically make me a pull request. So when there's a new version of the, poli uh, new version of the policy, it's super obvious if I can update my dependency and I can see clear feedback about where and why I'm not compliant. I can also see all the pull requests over the organisation, so I can measure the compliance of my policy as a whole. Moving on from that, App2 and Infra2 depend on version 2.00 of the policy. However, we could actually merge that open pull request all the way up to 2.11. Finally, App3 and Infra3 are dependent on 2.11, and they get a gold star from the CIO. There is 
I'll admit, a small touch of magic, and it's not pretty right now. I've written some bash. Don't judge me, even though I probably uh, definitely written worse, though. So what this does is it allows me from my dev laptop or in CI to evaluate my code against the version of the policy that's defined in the uh, resources. Ideally, this might be less cumbersome, but it is what it is for now. Pull requests and collaboration on this are very welcome. And the last piece of the puzzle is managing the life cycle of the policies and allowing multiple policies to be accepted and evaluated within a single runtime. I've cheated a bit here. Kubernetes gives you admission controllers. It's not so easy to get the same policy evaluation that I've found so far in cloud. Ultimately, the cloud vendors have got their own policy code and I've not figured out how to be able to evaluate that policy locally. Again, pull requests, contribution, collaboration from the community are all very welcome and really appreciated. So you may have noticed that the way the policy is designed and distributes itself lends well to coexist in a Kubernetes cluster. Which brings us to cluster one, which describes a cluster that accepts all the versions that we've described so far. Likewise, cluster two only accepts version 2.00 and greater. We can automate this with kind for CI to deploy the applications too. And there we have it, a full org, all done, all compliant policy, all um, versions, CIO, all aware of what's going on. So this is great, right? But just one more thing. Wouldn't it be awesome if the policy maybe carried a story, a narrative of why it exists in the first place? After all, if your agile team is even half effective, it will reject anything that it perceives as friction if it doesn't see the value in it. It could potentially allow our developers and engineers to know why they're compliant. And if they want to do something outside of what the policy permits, they don't need any sort of exemption granted per se. They can have then a well-reasoned and informed debate with rationale behind a pull request to the policy. So imagine, if you will, this going through the stage of uh, versions with risks that inform the mitigations manifested as policy, all maintained as one. So when the risk landscape changes, your policies can then move with it. So when some new privacy uh, regulation comes out or your latest marketing strategy pays off and you acquire more data, for example, even if your policy was perfect at one time, the risks and the appetite for that stand still for no one. So we can liken this to perhaps over-provisioning over that we might be familiar with from elsewhere, where lead times are long, change is hard, and there is a significant pressure in just nailing it the first time, which can lead us to, uh, to hedging our bets against what some future state might look like, rather than proportionate mitigation to the risks that are more tangibly real in the now. And that's where the real culture change is needed. And the execution of that is likely a long series of talks in of itself. So this is now really over to you. Honestly, the best thing you could do right now is tell me this is madness. Already done, irrelevant, uh, otherwise unachievable. Something so far my esteemed echo chamber of peers have yet to do. So beyond making pull requests and developing the theory more, I'd really like to start building a case study with a willing organisation and allow me to swap out my imaginary friends for some real ones. But the most important thing I want you to remember from our time together is that, and feel free to say this out loud with me, purposeless policy is potentially practically pointless policy. And I've been practising saying that Far too many times. So I've been Chris Nesbitt-Smith. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, you're now free to drop off if you wish. I am assure you I will try and destroy the evidence of your guilt admissions earlier. I'll try. Uh, like, subscribe, whatever the kids do these days uh, on LinkedIn, GitHub, um, whatever. You can be assured that there'll be near on no spam because I'm, uh, or much content really at all, since I'm pretty bad and awful at uh, self-promotion on social media. Uh, CNS.me ultimately just points to my LinkedIn. Uh, Talks.cns.me uh, contains this and other talks and they're all open source uh, as well on GitHub. 
Uh, questions are very welcome on this or anything else. I'll be hanging around in the comments section or ping me a message probably on LinkedIn uh, and I'll kind of come back to you. Um, thanks so much for joining me.